Okay, I think that sounds good. Um, it, it it actually works. Igor and I were talking. It works well that there are two of us, so uh, one of us will monitor the Slack window while the other is presenting, and and we'll sort of interrupt and at, interrupt each other with questions um, to, to sort of try and answer them. I think on the fly. Sometimes I find that works better to maintain the context of the question rather rather than wait, you know, many slides later. So okay. um, I think that that works well. Okay. So, so should should we time. should we proceed? Yep. Yep, it's 1.15, so we can get started. Okay. So just a, a brief introduction. Uh, Igor and I are both network architects at HPE, uh, working on the next generation of the Slingshot high-performance fabric. Um, Slingshot originated from Cray, where Igor and I both came from. Um, but with HPE's acquisition of Cray uh, recently, is now HPE's inter interconnect technology. Um, Igor, Igor forces focuses more on the NIC side, well, where my area of, of um, focus is more on the switch or the router uh, in the interconnect. So, um, you know, I was, I was looking at the Slack for the morning sessions and, and there was a question about interconnect. So in this, in this context, the interconnect for these big systems is essentially the network that connects the compute elements together. Um, you know, it, it, it consists of NICs, and switches and cables predominantly. That's sort of how we think of it. Um, it, it you know, and it could be as straightforward as, as Ethernet, right? Is, is that's, that's a viable uh, interconnect. But from a per performance standpoint, uh, interconnects such as Slingshot or InfiniBand offer a higher level, higher level of performance uh, for some of these large HPC systems um, that the DOE uh, uses. So we'll try and give an overview of the hardware that makes up the Fabric Interconnect and some of the challenges that we're solving. Um, we, we try not to make this specific to uh, a slingshot, um, but really try and raise some of the issues I think that, that any Interconnect hardware uh, vendor is, is dealing with and, and some of them, are, how we're solving those. Um, but many of our examples will be slingshot specific since that's what Igor and I uh, know and, and, and sort of work with every day. Okay, so um, this is the, th th this slide actually we've, um, has been used for several years. Uh, and this is really the DOE uh, system uh, architecture targets. And the sort of the middle green column is, um, it, our, is a prediction of the systems that essentially are in use today, the coral systems. Um, and, and I think of those as Sierra and Summit predominantly. Um, and, and for this presentation, sort of the, the lines that are most interesting are the system size, essentially the no, how many nodes are in the system and the total inter, the node interconnect bandwidth. So the, the injection or the bandwidth that each node you know, can inject and, and eject from the network. So the, the sort of the, the node size for the, the, the green, the middle column, the right side I think is, is more relevant to, to Sierra and Summit. And again, this, this, this came out of the DOA, DOE Exascale report, which was generated over 10 years ago. So, so these were targets that they were thinking about hitting. And the system size for Sierra and Summit around 5,000 nodes is, is reasonably accurate. The node interconnect bandwidth um, is actually a little bit low. Um, Sierra and Summit use uh, InfiniBand EDR, which is um, at 25 gigabytes per second, and they have a dual res system, so there's two of them. Um, now, looking forward to sort of the exascale machines that um, that we hope you know are online in the next year or two. And and the nodes, the the system size for the nodes, you know, sort of there's two columns in this sort of um, lavender uh, column here, and you know, I. I I think they're reasonably accurate, sort of somewhere in between. Is that is that we'll end up, you know, sort of in the middle of somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 nodes, um, you know, and, and sometimes I think of nodes as endpoints in the system also. Um, and as far as the interconnect bandwidth, the uh, slingshot, the, all, all of those systems will be using slingshot, and um, the projection here is a little bit high. They'll be around 50 gigabytes per second um, for each node, but certainly there's um, uh, many more nodes in the system. So the total, the total injection, total internet or um, node bandwidth is, is significantly larger. Okay. 
Um, so the general trends, you know, for for the, these large system architectures, um, the core clock frequency is not increasing. This isn't anything new. I think the the I've spent um, much of my career at Intel, and, and the core clock frequencies have been have been reasonably steady for for quite some time. So that this isn't anything that should be surprising. Um, but one of the things that, you know, where do we spend those transistors? And so the number of threads on a core typically is increasing. The number of cores on a node is also increasing. Um, and again, as I, as I sort of just, just showed, it's the number of nodes in the system is also increasing. And so, you know, that, that's, that's a, a new, you know, essentially a, a change in, from past systems that, that we as, as designers need to deal with. Um, and I think that the, the biggest change for these systems is that, uh, accelerators uh, are gaining prominence. Um, you know, what used to be um, something that was introduced many years ago, but, but wasn't, um, wasn't predominant has now become really what appears to be the, the, the way of the future for some of these larger systems. And, and this sort of leads to hybrid nodes. So we've got CPUs and GPUs in the nodes, and we've got to figure out, you know, the ratio of, of each of them, how many GPUs and CPUs we want, um, and, and how how they communicate and and um, you know stuff like that. So what does this mean for networks? Um, the the there's going to be more sharing of the network interconnect um, with more nodes. It, it leads to essentially um, the amount of communication from each node is it increases. Right, instead of communicating between a small number of nodes. You know, let's say a handful of nodes with large messages between them. What's going to happen now is that the job may be may be distributed over uh, many more nodes, maybe ten times as many nodes as it was previously. And what this means is that even if the amount of data that you're that each node is is sending out, they now need to send that data out to many more nodes, which means more smaller messages uh, essentially across the network rather than fewer large messages. Uh, another another item is that a single CPU core may not be able to fully saturate the NIC. It may be that we've got multiple cores communicating um, th to do that, but a single core typically uh, won't be able to do that. And then finally, as I as I sort of talked about, you know, a, a few minutes ago, is that accelerators, you know, are, are um, a new part of these systems, and they need to participate. They need to be able to participate in communication. In the past the accelerators often would have to go through the CPU for any sort of communication with other parts of the system, whether it's memory or network. And th that introduced extra overhead for those operations. So ideally what we'd like to do is make the accelerators sort of a first class citizen in, um, in the network such that it can, can, can communicate with a network adapter uh, directly rather than having to, having to loop back through the CPU to do it. Eric, we have a question. Um, okay. From Tarek, uh, Ethernet is going over 100 gigabit gigabyte, uh, I, probably yep. gigabits per second yep. right now. Why Ethernet is not gaining adoption compared to InfiniBand and Slingshot? If you like, I can try to answer this question, Eric. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, and and, and um, I'll add anything that I feel yeah. needs to be added. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, Ethernet is actually gaining adoption. Slingshot is Ethernet interconnect. Slingshot seamlessly handles both protocols, the what we call the uh, Slingshot transport and the Ethernet. So Ethernet is a first class citizen on a Slingshot. And when it comes to uh, verbs, uh, the Rocky, in, in my opinion, is gaining adoption. In fact, some of the early systems that we are delivering on a Slingshot is actually using a Rocky uh, to run MPI and OpenSchmem on top of the leak fabric. I, and I think one thing I'll add, I Igor, is that is that yet Slingshot can can talk Ethernet and what we what we call sort of optimized HPC um, Ethernet, which is which is our version, but it's optimized. But but the question I think probably referred to say a commodity Ethernet and. and I think some of the reasons, you know, Ethernet was was not designed for high performance networks, and so some of the things like latency, uh, reliability, um, it don't don't uh, don't match up to say what uh, InfiniBand or Slingshot offer. 
Um, and, you know, it's so the performance is more than just the bandwidth. The, the, the number that you quote is, is, you know, link bandwidth. So the Ethernet may match the link bandwidth of InfiniBand or Slingshot, but the latency, the reliability, um, some of the other features that I, that I will get into a little bit here just don't exist in commodity Ethernet. Okay, so, so this is sort of a, a simplified figure of, of what a typical node might look like. Um, and, and, and as I was talking about before is that, you know, we've got, we now have CPUs and GPUs uh, in the node and we, we would like to make it such the GPU can communicate natively uh, with the network adapter, which is sort of what we draw on here rather than have to go back uh, through the CPU to, to do so. And obviously that's gonna benefit. We'd, we'd like to use the network adapter that's closest to reduce the overhead in the node um, and, and increase performance. Um, and, and several IO technologies exist to connect up both the processing elements, whether it's CPU or GPU and the network adapter, and also to connect up the processing elements to them to each other, to themselves. And, and, and we expect that um, there's gonna be higher band, these IO technologies will provide higher bandwidth than the network links, you know, out into Slingshot or InfiniBand uh, will have going forward. Um, but but that's you know that's that's okay. I, I think oftentimes the you know we we ideally from a bottleneck perspective we like to match bandwidths or keep them close. But I think having you know a little extra bandwidth in, on the CPU side um, means that we can use as much of the network bandwidth as possible, since you drive the efficiency of the network up um, as much as we can, because that, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but, but the network costs um, are relatively high and the more efficiently we can use those, uh, those resources, the better it is for the system. Okay, so, so uh, I, the next section will, talk about uh, network adapters um, and uh, Igor is gonna gonna take over and, and talk about this. So go ahead, Igor, and just let me know when you want me to move the slides forward. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we will talk about network adapters and uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide where we are going to briefly discuss what are the trends uh, when it comes to the network adapters and what is motivating uh, the further network adapter development? Well, one of the motivating points is a really diverse workloads. We right now see uh, machine learning in artificial intelligence running on a larger and larger scale machines. We uh, hear from our customers that real-time data streaming is very important. And I think when it comes to uh, making uh, Ethernet a first-class citizen on a slingshot, it was basically driven by this requirement uh, because customers want to bring the data quickly at, and real, at, at real-time uh, speeds uh, uh, close to the computation. And traditional HPC, uh, needs to grow, uh, run on a larger scale and on a more complicated uh, setups, uh, hybrid uh, nodes as uh, Eric has shown a couple of slides ago. Another motivation and driving, driving force is actually the changing interfaces. Um, the new standard was adopted for the host interface called CXL Compute Express Link. Intel is driving the standard and they open, it's an open standard. Uh, they were driving PCI Express in, a long time ago and now they are doing the same with the CXL and uh, doing it successfully because we see the adoption uh, among the CPU and GPU vendors. So not only Intel going to support CXL in the future. The X CXL is interesting because it pretty much introduced three protocols. The CXL IO, is equivalent to the PCI Express 5 and beyond. CXL cache is really allows a network adapter to become cache agent. And that will help many uh, use cases. But in this case, I kind of point out that offloading atomics is, uh, would be one of the things that would work really well 
if a network adapter can play a role of the cache agent in the on the node. And then CXL MEM that has a great potential to build very interesting solutions for the network attached storage. Another trend is uh, data encryption. And it's motivated by the fact that customers uh, actually want to use uh, the data that is regulated. And there is a lot of standards like a HIPAA standard that requires that data would be encrypted in transaction and also at rest. And so the data encryption is a trend becomes more and more important in HPC uh, computing. While before we, of course, data encryption is not new and APSEC uh, has been around for a long period of time and it was extensively used, but in HPC data encryption will become more important and we will see I believe network adapters that, in, that uh, introduce this feature. Another important feature that have been around for a while and now uh, will be used more and more extensively in HPC is a server and a network virtualization. And one of the reasons, motivations behind it is that the fact that nodes become very complex and they have a lot of resources. And more frequently than not, these resources needs to be shared among the users, among different tenants of the system. And to provide the safe, way, like a secure way uh, for sharing resources on a node on or within a system, we need to be able to isolate them. And that's where virtualizations come in place. In play. And then the last one is, that I would like to bring here is increased programmability. You hear probably about this uh, programmable network adapters. And the reason, the motivation for increased programmability is actually diverse, of, uh, diverse workloads, which network adapters try to offload as much as possible. And this offloads requires programmability. The examples would be the data types of where transactions, which we're gonna discuss a little later. Access control list, which really helps uh, virtualization and isolation of the tenants. And also uh, tunneled RDMA and IP protocols that would be really important when we're uh, talking about the real-time data streaming, because you really need overlay tunnel in order to extend your reach beyond the data center that you're running your application within. I do not see any questions, so I'll ask Eric to advance the slide. So when it comes to, so we talked about motivation and the trends, and uh, now I want to discuss some of the uh, offloading techniques and the challenges when it comes to these techniques. Uh, MPI tag matching is a well-known uh, um, a well-known feature of the MPI, when, which allows basically sender to direct the traffic to a particular buffer described by the tag. And uh, traditionally matching is done on the host, but it now gets more and more network adapters offload this functionality. And, uh, and that allows to actually achieve higher rates like 100 and beyond 100 million packets per second. Uh, it presents challenges because uh, this matching needs to be done in order. And uh, if you uh, make adapter to do it, you're always dealing with a finite resource. So if you have large number of posted receives or you have large number of unexpected, unexpected messages, it will lead to the performance degradation and we will discuss it uh, in the following slides. The next top, uh, the next technique is a trigger decorations is, uh, is an interesting feature in my opinion that trending right now among network adapters. And what it allows is it allows to, for a GPU to trigger a transaction that was staged by a CPU. It really works well for the static communication patterns as CPU needs to reprogram them. 
But static communication patterns is not the only patterns that GPU uses. So there is also other techniques as called kernel initiated transactions. Are we not going to talk about them in this discussion? But it's something that's interesting to consider. Um, the, uh, I see the question and I will come to it uh, quickly after I finish this. Uh, counting event speed up completion notification and simplifies their processing. Uh, the, it, they work best for the batch matching processing with few distinct tags. So we basically, when you have the node waiting for batch of communications to complete before it starts uh, computing, for example, right? Like gather all the data from different sources and then start computing. Memory address translation and on-demand pages reduces memory footprint of application. Because if you don't pin the memory, you only access the memory that you need to have, uh, which you need at the given point of time. But at the same time, if you constantly move, uh, swap out the memory and end up with a very high uh, ODP rate, on-demand page rate, the performance will suffer because in order to bring, bringing pages into the memory is expensive. It involves system software. So we need to be very careful how we use ODP. And the data type handling is uh, the one we mentioned on the previous slide. It actually uh, will really benefit uh, the application because network adapter would be able to deliver the data directly into the user buffer without extra copying required by any libraries, MPI library or middleware, other middleware libraries. But it requires pre-programming. And so if you have a lot of different uh, types and you constantly changing them, the latency will suffer. If you can pre-program all your types and then run your application and use these derivative types, uh, uh, then, then your application will definitely benefit and uh, and ha and see the uh, better latency. Um, should we try to answer a question, Eric? Um, how much? Uh, I'll, I'll I'll read it aloud. Uh, how much of this smart hardware is exposed to HPC users, application programmers, and how much is relevant only to system integrators? Should I care about, for example? Tag matching, if I'm doing parallel array transpose and want to send tons of data over the wire as up, how can I tell if my MPI code is making best use of this? How, <laughs> it's a really good question. Um, how you can tell um, right now, I know the trend that MPI right now introducing more and more uh, statistical information available to the end user. So end user can actually look at um, how successful uh, and what he can improve, like uh, his application, uh, how well his application used the resources and how it can improve. I, I think there is a long, some ways for the, for the MPI to go to communicate this information. Um, what, does uh, the question is should application be aware? I think it does need to be aware to some degree. For example, if your application trying to initiate all to one transaction and basically says, well, why would I need to bother to build a tree or something? I'll just have all the instances accessing one variable when I need to sync up, for example, right? And you can implement this with, uh, with RMA, for example, right? If you do something like this, you need to be aware that as you scale, you may see unexpected performance degradation because you are creating in-cast and in-cast would be hand handled well to the self some degree, but, uh, but then there is a click. Uh, and no matter how uh, good the congestion control is, and that's something that we believe that Slingshot handles very well, uh, there is still click. And we, we build uh, now larger and larger systems. And it actually up to the software designers, application designers to build the smart algorithms to get the best use 
of uh, resources. And we're actually going to talk about another technique right now on this slide that Eric brought us to. So tag matching, right? When, how tag matching works. So you have a packet arriving from the network and each packet will match on a priority list. And if there is, if it doesn't find anything, it will append to an expected list. So here's a one, right? If you did not pre-post receives, your message will end up on an unexpected list. And this unexpected list can grow very large. And at one point, it will use up all the entries available in hardware, right? List entries available in hardware. And that could be a very large pool, but it, will, it is finite pool. And on a large system, it's still possible to is hosted, right? And then what happens is different adapters implement different techniques where they fetch additional entries, but they will be, they, that's coming at the price, right? Uh, in other scenario, when you actually decide to pre-post in a lot of entries, well, pre-posting entries, all these pre-posted entries will go to the priority, on a priority list. And that list can grow very large too, and that will affect matching. Because in MPI, we need to match in order. So it's not, it's impossible just to build a, for example, hash map and say that I'll just get the best match. Uh, it needs to be matched in order. Some tags, you have the same tag and you need to make sure that you deliver an order. So we, uh, the structure uh, that match you're using is complicated and uh, size is important in that case. I lost a view of slides. It's not just you. I think everybody yeah. did, did, did Eric get kicked out or something? I, I wonder if, if he, he did. I'm seeing, do I need to reshare? Yeah, reshare yeah, please so. Eric, because nobody sees. Let's see, sorry, I just had some sort of drop. Okay. Yep, I see it. Is that, uh, do you see that? Yep, yep, we do. Okay. I would say carry so, on. And, and we're running a little bit late, Igor, so just uh, oh, FYI. I'll speed up. Yes, thank okay. you. I, oh, I see it. Wow. Okay, uh, let's advance. Uh, I'll try to go faster. Sorry, thanks for reminding. Advance to the next one, please. Yeah, so trigger operations. What the trigger operation is, you have operations connected to the, attached to the counter, and each operation is associated with a threshold. The counter can get advanced by either updates initiated by CPU or GPU, or by the completion events. And when the, and when the counter matches a threshold, this operation fires up. And that's how it's easy for a GPU to use. And that's why uh, I believe that more and more uh, network adapters will be using these techniques for the kernel triggered and stream triggered operations. Let's advance. Uh, counting and full events. What are the difference between them? The counting event is basically counter gets incremented and each instance of the counter includes a success and the error counter. Error counter gets implemented when we need to tell software the error happened. Usually error counter gets incremented along with a full event being delivered. So software can actually handle this error. The counters can be updated and then the published to the host memory. Either it's, it's programmable, it's either on every increment, which is uh, less, uh, less desirable, or at the threshold. And it really works well when you have a process waiting for end messages to complete before it proceeds to the next step. Full events on the other side, match, mapping better to MPI send and receive semantics because it, uh, and it also allows uh, truncate, uh, send, truncate the transaction. So when you're sending transaction and buffer is not ready, you truncate it and then software can complete the transaction. It's impossible to do with accounting events, but with a full events, it can be implemented and is implemented uh, on the software stacks for many adapters. 
Let's advance, please. Uh, address translation, which touched on address translation earlier. I just want to mention right now that on the hybrid nodes, we have CPU and GPU units, and they represented on some, in some cases by unified virtual, uh, uh, virtual memory. Uh, software addresses memory using virtual address. Network adapter will use address translation service um, defined by the PCI Express standard to obtain the translation and cache it for the future uh, access. But what if physical memory is not backing the virtual memory? In that case, there is a speech request interface, again, part of the PCI Express standard, which triggers on-demand paging. The result of on-demand paging could be a migration of the page from the GPU memory to CPU memory or other way around, or bringing the page, allocating the fresh physical page to back the given virtual space, virtual address, and so transaction can complete. Having high rate of ODPs will slow down performance and create also back pressure into the network. So we need to be careful uh, with uh, how, uh, how frequently we access new offsets, which may not be back, or also the rate of the page migration we may trigger. Uh, next one, please. And the data types, that would be the last one in, the, in my section of the presentation. So um, IOVEC is the best known data type when the data is described by the series of memory regions. It's used for the storage luster, it takes advantage of IOVEC, uh, and it's also used by MPI. But MPI also defines its own data types and it allows to describe derived data types. Usually when the derived data types is used, uh, software needs to stage uh, source and destination by copying the data into the contiguous buffer. Offloading this uh, handling of the data types to hardware will really benefit the performance because now software doesn't need to do extra copy. It's true zero copy transaction when the send and receive uh, would be able to just hand the data type and the hardware will send the packet in a single, uh, send the data, sorry, send the data in a single packet and it would be a more efficient messaging scheme and it will deliver it also in a data type structure on the receiver side. So user can consume it right away without extra copying on the host. So if there is no more questions, um, I'm hanging back to you, Eric. Okay. I don't see any questions. Uh, oh. There is one just came up. Are yep. there any commonly used benchmark codes to evaluate the benefit of MPI data types on a particular system? I I don't know the answer to this question. Sorry, Christopher. Maybe somebody else closer to MPI I'm, <laughs> or benchmarking. Otherwise, we'll continue. Yeah, maybe we can find find that answer um, after after we're done. Okay, um, so the next section uh, I titled interconnect and topologies, but really this is we're going to talk about the switch and the things it supports. Topologies is is certainly one of them. Um, okay. Um, so, so network topology. So the topology describes how the switches and endpoints or the nodes in a network connect to each other. An ideal topology would be would be an all-to-all -all network, an all-to-all -all connectivity. And, and this basically means, you know, all the, in, in this sort of first figure to the right, all the network adapters connect to a single switch, right? So so they all would, would have a direct connection to a single point. Now, um, it, you know, reality limits the limits us with this switch to about 64 ports, at least 64 ports at, at the highest bandwidth that we're offering today. Um, and obviously 64, um, 64 endpoints or network adapters is, is not a very big system. Um, and, and, and so we need to come up with some topology to, to connect switches together 
which ultimately connects uh, endpoints or nodes together. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, fa uh, a hop count. A and so the fabric hop count is the number of switch to switch links traversed by a packet. And you can, another way to view this is, is the distance between nodes across the network. Um, and so as the node count grows, naturally the fabric hop count is going to grow. Um, and you know, in, in the figure in the upper right, we've got 16 network adapters connected to a single switch. If we want to go, and, and that's really just a figure for illustration because putting 64 of those in here would make it quite busy. But if we want to go beyond 64 nodes, um, you know, we might get up to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of nodes to connect together. That's sort of uh, that's sort of the framework that we're looking at for exascale. These ex exascale systems that are coming online in the next year or two. It's conceivable that in the next several years we may need to connect hundreds of thousands of of nodes together in, in a single high performance network. And so we want to minimize the hop count while sort of maintaining a certain level of performance. Um, and, and the reason we want to do this is that every time a packet takes a hop across the network, it consumes some number of fabric resources. And those resources are link bandwidth, uh, buffering space in the switch, um, and, and of course, moving that packet or that data consumes power. And so the more hops that we take, the more of these resources we take with every single hop, the more resources that a single packet consumes, the more we have to allocate into the network to move that data across. Um, and and the, other, the, the other issue is that it increases the probability of interference or congestion um, between packets. Obviously, the more time a packet spends in the network, the more likely it's going to be that, that um, it, it runs into or contends with, with another packet flow. And fewer hops, you know, I, I talked about resources a little bit, but fewer hops also means a lower fabric cost, right? The, the, and, 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 and lower fabric cost really means less switches and cables required to connect all the nodes together. Um, and you might wonder, well, why do we care about cost of the network? Um, but, but ultimately for a fixed budget, um, the less we spend on the network, the more we can save on the network, the more money is available to spend on compute and the more compute resources can be, um, can be purchased and allocated into the system. And so that, that's sort of um, why we want to look that way. So um, the, the, I'm just going to look at the topologies for sort of the current and the future um, uh, sort of big DOE systems. I'm not going to get into some of the ones in the past. Um, so, so fat tree is what um, is common for current systems. Both Sierra and Summit are fat trees. Um, and with a three level fat tree, which, uh, um, uh, which I believe Sierra and Summit both are, um, we have a maximum fabric hop count of four. You can sort of see this picture in the upper right. If, if you, the circles on the bottoms are nodes and then the boxes, the sort of teach boxes are, are switches. And, and if you, if you, um, you know, you can sort of work through, but if you go to a node, you know, sort of on the left and move over to the node on the right, you'll, you'll cross four switch to switch lengths going up the tree to the top and then back down to the to the bottom. And and so the 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 upper picture is a fully configured fat tree and this is what summit is. Um, and and basically what this means is that it's a tree with equal bandwidth at, at each level. And so if you look at you know any switch in the upper upper right picture, um, each switch, each box has eight blue lines and each of those blue lines is a network link. And, and so the bandwidth coming out of each of those switches is equal at each level. So each of them have eight links coming out with them. And, um, it, and, and to be a little bit more specific, each of them have four links going up and four links going down. So the, so the uplink bandwidth is equal to the downlink bandwidth. What this means is that the fat tree is non-blocking between um, any pair and any node pairing that you can create. So any permutation of node pairs that you create, there are enough links in, in a fully configured fat tree to, that um, those, those node pairs should be able to communicate at full network link bandwidth. This doesn't always happen in practice because at some point um, the, the routing algorithm is gonna choose which uplink. And so to, to, for that to fully work, um, the routing algorithm had be per would have to be perfectly aware of, of the, the pairings. Um, but but, but in, in theory, it, it does provide, um, 
it, it does provide uh, non-blocking bandwidth, but what that basically means in practice is that there's a lot of extra bandwidth in a fully provisioned fat tree. And um, in, in some sense, it's over-provisioned because the, the network pairing that you might come up with, you know, that essentially we can support full bandwidth between, um, we're not always gonna, gonna come up with sort of the worst case scenario of node pairings. And so even though there's a lot of extra bandwidth, we may not always use it. But what this means is the performance is quite good in a fully provisioned fat tree. The downsides are that there, a large percentage of these fabric cables are optical cables, and those are very expensive. Um, and, and what it means is that the, a fully provisioned fat tree gets, can get very expensive at the larger scales that we're talking about for these exascale class machines. Now, one of the solutions we can come up with is to taper the bandwidth. And so the, the figure in the bottom right is essentially a fat tree with uh, tapered bandwidth. And, and what you can see at the middle level um, is that we have half as many uplinks coming out of the middle level of switches as downlinks. And so the bandwidth going up is 50% of the bandwidth going down. Um, what this means is it's no longer non-blocking between all pairs of nodes. But again, as I, as I mentioned previously, we may not need to provide, provide that, that level of bandwidth for all nodes. It, it may be a worthwhile trade-off to reduce the cost um, and maybe be a little bit smarter about how the job is scheduled such that we don't need all that extra bandwidth. And what this also means is that we reduce the number of cables. These are typically optical cables and routers. You can see in the figure in the lower right, there's fewer, fewer uh, routers or switches. Uh, um, I, I, I use those interchangeably, but, but they're essentially the same thing for, for sake of argument here. Um, there's fewer uh, switches and there's fewer of sort of the blue links going from the middle level to the top level, and those are those amount to be cables. Now, one of the downsides of a fat tree is that, and you can sort of see on the right, is the number of cables and routers increases super linearly with node count. So it's not a direct one-to-one -one correlation between, um, between routers and cables. If we get to a certain number of nodes, we might need to go to a four-level fat tree. And so you take, you know, one of the figures here, you'd add another level of switches above it and, and all those extra cables to connect them. And from a job scheduling standpoint, um, what we wanna do is schedule the jobs to minimize the fabric hops between hosts that are communicating with each other. And you can sort of see you know, I, um, how that might happen if, if you schedule the job sort of on the left side of the network, then you'd only need the bottom level and the middle level of switches to communicate amongst those nodes. And so, um, so there is some locality there when you're scheduling jobs that will benefit um, benefit the user from a performance standpoint. Okay, oh, time, I'm, I'm running pretty slow on time. I'm gonna go through this quickly um, and, and try not to run over much. So uh, the Dragonfly topology is what both of the, what the exascale machines that the DOE um, has and, and what, will be, what, um, what we'll be using. So basically in this topology, every router has nodes connected to it, unlike the fat tree. And, and a group contains routers that are all to all connected. You can see this on the right, that every um, box, every router switch is connected to every other one with a, directly with a blue link, blue line, which is, a, which is essentially a cable. And then all, all groups themselves in the system are all, co all connected to each other. You can sort of look at the figure in the, in the lower right and, and figure that out. And so as I said, Aurora Frontier and El Capitan uh, are all planning on using a, a one-dimensional dragonfly. And, and it's primarily driven by cost as the system scale grows. So now you can see there's a linear increase in the number of cables and routers with system size. So as we add more nodes, there's a linear increase in the fabric resources required. And in fact, the way this works is that there's a less than a third of the fabric cables are optical. And, and, and for the systems above, it may be as low as one sixth of the, of the cables are optical. And the, another advantage is this scales to four times the number of nodes as a three level fat tree. Again, this, this helps reduce cost. And, and the maximum hop count is three. And so if you trace this through, you, you take one hop in the source group, you take a hop between groups, and then you take a hop to the destination switch in the destination group. Now, because we don't over provision the bandwidth in a dragonfly is that it requires sophisticated adaptive routing to, um, to be, to, to work well. And, and that's something that we have in, in the slingshot 
um, switch, um, but, it, but it is a requirement to make the system perform well. From a job scheduling standpoint, um, it's a little bit different than the factory. If, it, if a job can fit within a group, and typically a group for one of these big systems is 256 or 512 nodes, the job can fit is smaller than that, then we wanna fit it in a single group. However, if the job is bigger than that, we don't wanna put it in just two groups. If it's just a little bit bigger, let's say 700 nodes, because um, the, the bandwidth between individual group pairs is low compared to both the node injection bandwidth into the group and the total bandwidth out of the group. And so a better solution actually is to break the, the job up into much smaller um, you know, quantities of nodes and spread those out randomly across the system. That actually gives us much better performance. So I think this will be the last slide that I will talk to since we're just about out, out of time. So I talked about adaptive routing. Um, this is on a per packet basis, and this is used to choose where a packet goes. Um, this really targets topological based congestion. And so I think of that as congestion that is caused by the topology. So we have unrelated flows crossing in the network that might create a, a hotspot. If we were to change the topology or change the wiring, that might go away. So that's what adaptive routing is addressing. And essentially it's used to route around temporal hotspots. So if we use it sparingly, a, routing a packet via a longer path will reduce latency. Right? If, if there's a temporal hotspot and there's a lot of packets waiting to get through a particular link, it might make sense to, to take two or three links to get around it, none of which have any weights or any buffering. Um, but if you use adaptive routing too much, if you use it excessively, such that all those alternate paths now um, have lots of packets waiting to use them, then it turns out that going a longer path will make, it, make the latency worse and decrease the bandwidth. So it's, it's, it's a really useful feature, but you wanna make sure that you use it um, sparingly and at the right spots, not sort of everywhere. So the other, the, the, another feature is a quality of service classes. And this is the part of arbitration. We, and this is used to choose which packet to advance, what to send next. And we have tunable classes that may use priority, a minimum and maximum bandwidth allocation. We might have a routing biases to, to sort of bias the path one way or the other. And some example classes, we might have a low latency class, say for synchronization, standard compute for let's say typical MPI sends and receives, or bulk data class for IO jobs who are doing a lot of bandwidth, require a lot of bandwidth, but don't care about latency. And a job can actually use multiple classes. Um, it might be such that the synchronization events use the low latency class while the standard sends receives use the standard compute class. It, it, um, and the idea here is to provide performance isolation for different classes of traffic, sort of, you know, as I say, the synchronization versus the IO data, let's say. And, and sort of the last thing I'm gonna talk about here is congestion management. Um, and this really targets workload-based congestion. And so I think of this congestion as uh, congestion caused by the application, maybe an in-cast or a many to few, many to one. And this is the kind of thing that changing the topology or adding, you know, cables won't change the, won't change this congestion, right? If you have a, if you have a 50 to one in cast, no amount of additional network bandwidth or topology changes is going to change the fact that you may be injecting 50 times as much bandwidth as the receiver can, can um, eject from the network, can, can pull, pull off the network. And so the solution here is that we want to identify um, the cause of congestion and, and throttle those sources to prevent those sources from injecting at more bandwidth than the receiver can receive. And, and this actually works well. It prevents, highly, it prevents the buffers from getting highly filled, which causes congestion and latency issues and contention. Um, and, and the benefit is the applications uh, are much less vulnerable to other traffic on the network. Typically, a, a many-to-one or in-cast won't swamp a network and cause other applications to start performing very poorly. And this gives us much more predictable run times um, and a lower mean and tail latency. And, and this, of course, is a benefit with applications that have a global synchronization. And so um, the next couple of slides, I'm not going to go into because we're running over, but the next couple of slides just show some examples of some of those features that I just talked about. and, and what the benefits of them are. And you can sort of see they're both simulation, 
they're both simulated systems and real systems um, to, to, to illustrate what some of these features give us. Um, I, I'll, I'll encourage you to look at the slides, um, but since we're running late, I won't go into them in, in any amount of detail here. Thanks, um, thanks, uh, Eric. Thanks, Igor. May I, 